Hey there, everybody. Alec Chrisman here, your relevant or possibly irrelevant TA for Poly 231 Intro to Political Theory. I'm doing a recording, a set of recordings, based on a poll that I sent out to all my students on the thinkers that people were most confused about and most needed to review. Now, I'm going to say the same thing I did at the start of those other videos. This video is not meant to substitute for you going back rereading Weber. I think this video can serve two main purposes. One, watching it before you go back and reread can give you an idea of what to look for when you're rereading, so I think that's a perfectly fine use for it. It also gives you a good idea of, like, the things that the thinker just can't believe. Like, if you if you read Weber and it seems like he's saying that, like, bureaucracy is bad, then you're reading Weber wrong, right? He That is just, it, it, it helps bound some of the mistakes that you might be tempted to make when just reading them fresh. And Weber particularly being a very, very thick writer, this is important with him. And the other thing it's meant to do is, it's meant after you've gone through and read, if you're still confused, it's meant to offer another kind of view, another take, another angle, another perspective, another way of saying some of the stuff that Professor VMF has already been saying. But again, if you need another way about it, that's the whole reason that we have these discussion boards. And I wanted to do this since because the discussion boards are kind of low bandwidth. Maybe you have another avenue of helping explain this stuff. Most of what I'm going to say here is stuff that I've said in my office hours already, but this is it a little more condensed and put in a much more review-friendly format, I think, though all of that's going to be available for you on the mass Google Doc that I sent out. So Weber. People being confused about Weber. A couple things on this, and I think the biggest thing that's confusing people on Weber is something we worked through a bit with Williams, so I think it might not be as confusing if you go back and read the second time. But the fact that Weber is primarily operating here as a descriptive sociologist. Put in the terms that I've used in my office hours, he's primarily making empirical claims as opposed to normative claims. He's primarily making claims about how politics is rather than about how politics ought to be. He does have some normative points in there, and we'll get to those. But overall, most of this is him trying to tell you how politics works, not how politics should work or ought to work. And this comes into in his definition of the state. The state being the community of humans that successfully claims, does not successfully not in terms of the claim is accurate, but successfully in terms of enough people believe it's such that the state continues to function, successfully claims the monopoly on the legitimate use of force, again, perceived legitimacy. He's not making a claim that it is actually ontologically, morally legitimate the way that like a contractarian tries to say that a state that respects, like Locke tries to say that a state that respects life, liberty, and property is legitimate. It is That it is truly morally legitimate. Weber's saying it's the community that successfully lays claim to the monopoly on the legitimate use of force within a given territory. The main thing that got people hung up on this is they're like, oh, Weber's saying states are legitimate. And Weber thinks a lot of states are legitimate. Like, it's just if you asked him, he would say that. But that's not the way to use his ideas in this essay. The way to use his ideas in this essay is, you know, legitimacy, and we'll get into this a bit in the Burke Hume lecture, I think. But legitimacy you can see it in the way people behave, he might say as an empirical sociologist. When most people aren't out there rebelling, when most people are paying their taxes, when most people open up when a cop knocks on their door, when most people pull over when they see flashing red and blue lights in their rearview mirror, we've been paying a lot more attention to the state's use of force in a lot of popular political conversations lately. But it remains true that the state does not have enough soldiers, enough police, enough National Guard to compel this obedience from every individual citizen. There is not a soldier every step of the way or a cop on every single corner forcing you not to jaywalk or forcing you not to steal or forcing you to pay your taxes. There, people just mostly do this on their own in terms of that's just how they behave. So Weber's going, why do they do that? And he offers a couple different modes by which states claim legitimacy. Traditional legitimacy, charismatic legitimacy, and bureaucratic legal legitimacy. 
Traditional legitimacy, this is how we done things for a long time. Why do we follow the king? Because his dad was who we listened to, and his dad was who we listened to, and his dad was who we listened to, and his dad is who we listened to. It's just what we do here. Echoes of Hume. And it's worked out okay for us, right? That's traditional legitimacy. The influence in culture that someone like the Queen of England has, or the royal family has, almost entirely traditional legitimacy at this point. They have next to no charismatic... Have you seen Prince Charles? They have next to no charismatic and not a ton of legal legitimacy, really. Charismatic legitimacy is your great politician, is the person who says, by virtue of your great religious leader, by virtue of the fact that you want me to rule, that I've convinced you, that I have done incredible things, this is kind of Machiavelli-ish. Machiavelli talks about traditional legitimacy in terms of, you know, there are principalities that are handed down to you. And really, once you get a principality handed down to you via traditional means, Machiavelli says, you'd have to really screw it up to lose it, right? But he's talking to people who are trying to set up charismatic legitimacy. If we frame Machiavelli in Weberian terms, Machiavelli is saying, go out there, do great things and show that you're worth following, show that you're powerful. Show that you are capable of bringing glory to the nation. And you will be respected. In a modern day context, you have the politician who is so, so convincing, so dazzling in their words, so, so genuine maybe, so real, so easy to connect to, right? Different societies will have different ideas of what counts as charismatic. But the idea is this person convinced you to follow them. As close to a pure example, and then we'll talk about why it's bad to talk about pure examples, but I did a pure example for the first one. So as close to a pure example of charismatic legitimacy might be the character Machiavelli talks about Savonarola, the mad monk of Florence, who Florence was like the um, the Wall Street of its day. And imagine if in Wall Street, there was a Catholic preacher that came out and was just so charismatic and preached so strongly against wealth and decadence and all this stuff that he got all these investment bankers and all the people, all the janitors of all different classes to come together and burn their Maseratis and Lamborghinis and their really expensive electronics. Like, think about how insane that would be and then realize that actually happened in Machiavelli's lifetime. Savonarola was a Catholic monk who did this. Look up the bonfire of the vanities if you want to know more. Not the book, the actual historical event. So, that's charismatic legitimacy. And both of those are present in Machiavelli. Both of those are present in pre-modern times. Machiavelli, a lot of people date the start of Machiavelli, or start of modernity either to Machiavelli or to Hobbes. Somewhere in there. But Weber thinks there's something new. Something that's characteristic of modernity. And this is what he calls in various translations legal or bureaucratic legitimacy. And the idea behind this is the legitimacy of rules, the legitimacy of agreed upon public rational rules. We get together and we decide, you know, when we set up the constitution, whatever it is, to make a particular kind of electoral system. And this electoral system is the rules of the game. And, and both sides, both people running an election, ideally, pre-commit to the idea that whoever wins according to this set of rules, we do our best, we look for the strategies that are most effective in these rules, and we press those strategies as strongly as possible. But at the end of the day, whoever wins according to these rules, we accord them legitimacy because the rules were public. There are reasons for the rules, right? There are reasons why you might want a first-past-the-post system or a proportional representation system or an electoral college. And yes, despite what you see a lot online, there are arguments in favor of the electoral college. It's not just a random thing, right? All this is to say these rules now, you judge whether or not some of these rules are more or less rational. Maybe you argue there are ways to make the rules more rational. But the goal is to make them more rational, to make them more public, to make them more, more people can agree on them. Again, maybe hear an echo of Rawls here. That which is legitimate is that what can be rationally publicly agreed on. And we follow these rules, and these rules have their own legitimacy to them. Why should someone who didn't vote for Joe Biden, sorry to use the American examples, it's just who I am. Why should someone who didn't vote for Joe Biden support Joe Biden? Why? 
Well, there's some Rousseauian arguments we could go to, but the Weberian argument would be, listen, because both he and Donald Trump beforehand agreed that whoever won this, like they tacitly agreed by being part of the system, whoever won this was going to was going to be president. And we all kind of understood that, at least enough of us, right? There are people denying Joe Biden was legitimate because of fraud and all that, but notice how they're denying it. They're saying he's not legitimate because he broke the rules. They're arguing on Weber's terms. They're not saying he's not legitimate because the other guy's more charismatic. They're saying he's not legitimate because the rules weren't followed. That was instantly the nature of the argument that they went to. It was instantly the nature of the argument that went to with Donald Trump when Donald Trump won as well. This is how people argue about this stuff. And Weber goes, this new kind of thing, this bureaucratic legal legitimacy, is the coin of modernity. And it's deeply tied to what the bureaucracy does in a modern state. What does the bureaucracy do? It carries out policy in efficient public, rules-oriented, and fair ways. When I get my vaccine, I know exactly what the rules are for when I get the second shot of my vaccine. I know exactly when I'm eligible. I know exactly where to look if I'm confused. There's a website where they put it all up there for me. I know who's going to be handing it out. I know who made the decision. I can trace it up to the Oregon Board of Health, right? I know who to call. It's public. It's open. And it makes a kind of sense. Right? They have reasons that they can give you online. They have whole, like, 40-page documents you can look through, laying out their reasons for doing this, that distribution plan. And so, when I go to get that second shot of my vaccine, I can follow all this. All this makes sense. That's what bureaucrats do. They follow, they implement policy according to public rational rules. So is Weber saying that we should just have a government, a government of bureaucrats? No, he's not. And this is where we get closer to his normative stance on politics. Because you got all these rules, sure. And you got all these people ready and raring to implement policy. But then the question comes, what policy are they going to implement? Bureaucrats know how to do things efficiently, Weber argues. But knowing how to do is not knowing the same as knowing what to do. Who decides what we are to do? And for Weber, this is the charismatic leader. The person that hopefully you vote for, but we should also remember that Weber wrote the articles, the emergency power articles in the Weimar Constitution that Hitler eventually used to seize power. So keep that in mind. One of the problems with doing history of, with Germany in this particular time period, right? There's a, there's a monstrous storm cloud on the horizon. But the charismatic leader decides what the government does. And hopefully, in a democracy, we vote for that charismatic leader. And that charismatic leader needs to know, needs to have a balance of, and this is where you get to the, the should part of Weber's lecture. They need to be able to balance the ethic of conviction with the ethic of responsibility. The ethic of conviction being, I believe what I believe, and I'm here to change the world for better. And the ethic of responsibility, another way to think of it is, you know, there's that famous, uh, another German, Otto von Bismarck quote, politics is the art of the possible. It doesn't matter. Trying to do something impossible in politics means you just do nothing. You're not doing politics. Maybe you're doing PR for yourself. Maybe you're making yourself feel better. Maybe you're feeling virtuous. Maybe you're feeling righteous, Weber would say. But you're not doing anything. And what's the point of politics if you don't do anything? So you need to have conviction to tell you where to go. But you also need the ethic of responsibility to know how far to go. To know how to get there. To know how much of your plan you need to keep. What, the things you cannot give up. And the things that you can sacrifice. The things that you can set aside. The deals that you can make. The good politician has to balance... Both of these things. They cannot be the pure bureaucrat that only operates on the ethic of responsibility. That only goes, these are the rules, I follow them, da 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 That only makes the prudent decision. You have to know what not to give up, but you also have to know when to be prudent. There's an echo of Machiavelli. They, there's a reason we read these two together. The ethic of conviction, the ethic of responsibility do not map on to the fox and the lion at all. But what you see here is a similar kind of split in the leader. The leader needs to have a kind of dual persona that is both Savonarola and Henry Kissinger. 
that is both, I have true beliefs and I will follow them, and I will do what I must to maintain power and deal with advancing my moral worldview in a broken world. In a world where people are allowed to get you. In a world where people want to destroy you, destroy your career, destroy your country, sometimes. This is the way to understand the role of the politician in Weber's system, and to remember that every system has a mixture of traditional charismatic and bureaucratic legal legitimacy. Every system has a mix of them. Every individual politician, maybe, has different mixes of them. One of the reasons why we occasionally elect the sons of former prime ministers is because of traditional legitimacy, right? You know? Pierre Trudeau is pretty good at his job. Maybe Justin Trudeau is probably, he's going to be at least probably good enough at his job, right? We've had a Trudeau before. That's what we do in Canada. We elect Trudeaus. Just what we do. But he's also got legal legitimacy. He made his way up that party hierarchy. There are rules, public rules, for how you become leader of the Liberal Party. And he followed them and he pulled it off, right? He played the game well and he followed the rules. That gives him legal legitimacy. There's no pure cases. I identified a few to make some clear, but there are no real true pure cases. And if so, they don't really last long, if there are any. So that's a couple things. If you've got more questions on Weber, I'll be excited to hear them at the group review session. But for now, that's maybe a way to start thinking about him and putting that massive multi-part essay into context. So hope that helped and uh, check out the other videos.